Welcome everybody. My name is Sarah Bunin Benor, and I'm the director of the HUC JIR Jewish Language Project. We're so glad that you've joined us today for this wonderful webinar by Rabbi Reuven Chaim Klein. He's going to be talking about Jewish names that are based on the names of holidays. And uh, Rabbi Ruben Chaim Klein is an Israel-based educator and freelance researcher who holds an MA in Jewish education from Middlesex University. His internationally syndicated weekly column about synonyms in the Hebrew language and his other scholarly articles and lectures are available for free online. And I'll turn it over to you, Ruben Chaim Klein. Go for it. All right, thank you. Um, so. The, the topic of tonight's uh, lecture is Jew. Uh, that the, the topic is Jewish festal names, which are names of uh, uh, proper names that come from names of festivals of holidays. So, it's you know, to me it's an interesting concept because it represents the intersection of different interests that I find interesting, like uh, history, linguistics, etymology, halacha, minhagim. Uh, even reading Tanakh, things like that, all come together in the in the in the concept of um, of names that are related to holidays. So I wanted to talk specifically about that topic. It, personally, I find um, what we call first names or personal names, given names, more interesting because they're usually more conservative, they're more traditional, and you know, when it comes to last names or surnames. Family names they can be like all over the place and you know it, there's there, it's a whole different discussion. So I want to focus our discussion this evening on first names or given names that come from names of holidays. Now some of these are going to be more speculative, some of these are going to be more obvious, but uh, we'll go through a whole bunch of different examples and understand the milieu and you know the time and place and where they these names you know came about. What they what exactly they mean, and uh, you know, are they used nowadays, etc. You know, some maybe some examples of famous people that had those names, and that's basically what we're going to do. So you know, just to see a uh, raise of hands, you know, how many people here know somebody with the name Pesach, right? Yeah, I see, I see a lot of people raising their hands. You know, Pesach. Pesach is a fairly common name. You know, we we know people with the name Pesach, and on the other hand, how many people here know somebody? with the given name Sukkos, right, Sukkot. How many people know people with that name, right? I don't see any hands going up. So you know, it's some, sometimes it gets a little bit arbitrary. Sometimes you'll have one holiday that is a legitimate name that people give, and then another holiday, which is quite unheard of to have a first name from that holiday. You know, in the same, in the same, by the same token, you have how many people know somebody named Nisan, right? Nisan is one of the names of the Jewish calendar, one of the months of the Jewish calendar. There are people named Nisan. And if anybody knows somebody named Tishrei, please raise your hand, right? Nobody's raising their hand. So it's sort of like arbitrary or, you know, it, it's interesting, like, how how does it come about that, like, some names just, they, they make it and some names don't make it. So these are the types of questions that those who study you know, Jewish um, onom onomastics, the this, this study of names, might be interested in and might be, uh, you know, looking to uh, to research. So we're starting with this concept of these festal names, which are names named after holidays um i i came i came into this topic when i came across this article online called the uh, jewish festal names in antiquity a neglected area of onomastic research in the journal of for the study of judaism 2005 so i saw that article and that was very interesting and some of the things that i'm going to present to you this evening come from that article and some of these things most of the things are not from that article are more original ideas that i 
came up with myself or um, you know gathered from the sources by myself. One question you might ask is, you know, why would somebody have a festival name? Why would somebody have a name that comes from the name of a holiday? We, we're, we're familiar with names of people that come from, let's say, uh, or names of people that come from earlier names of other people that were in the Bible or in you know, traditional Jew, Jewish sources or are names that come from words. But what's this idea of names that come you know, from the name of a festival or from the name of a holiday? Where, where does it come from? Um, you know, it's it's hard to know exactly where it comes from. Maybe just because those names of holidays were, you know, popular words, so they just entered the the onomasticon, the corpus of of names. Or maybe it's because you know people were born on or around the holiday, so someone decided, you know, oh, I'm going to give him this name. I'm going to name him, name him Pesach or name him, you know, Purim or something like that. You know, just because you know that was the the spirit of the season. So, you know, you, you, you give them that name. It's hard to know exactly, or their namesake was born then. It's hard to know exactly where and where these types of names come from. Um, and what I'm not talking about, though, are names that are related to the holiday that people have. You know, let's say if somebody was born on Purim, so you would name him Mordechai. That's not what I'm talking about, because there, Mordechai is a name after a character in Tanakh. What I'm talking about is naming him actually the name of the holiday, not a name that's related to the holiday, but a name of the actual holiday itself. So let, 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 let's go through some examples of names that come through holidays, and you can see sort of better what I'm trying to talk about. What I view as the quintessential festal name is the name Yom Tov. The name Yom Tov. Uh, the word Yom Tov literally means good day. Yom is good is day, and Tov is good. And Yom Tov is the standard rabbinic uh, term for holidays. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with people whose name are is Yom Tov. You know their their actual name is Yom Tov. You know historically speaking, the name Yom Tov, we find a lot of examples of it. Um, you know, most famously, probably, is Rabbi Yom Tov Lipman Heller, who lived in Prague in the 1600s. Um, you know, there is Yom Tov, Rabbi Yom Tov of Seville, who lived in Spain in the you know, late 1200s, early 1300s. There is Rabbi Yom Tov of London, who lived in the 10, 1100s. There's Rabbi Yom Tov of Ghazi, who lived in Jerusalem in the 1700s. So Yom Tov was, you know, a fairly popular name in various different places and times. You know, Rashi had a grandson named Yom Tov of Trevis. It doesn't have a Wikipedia page, but it does have a page on Jenny.com. So, you know, Yom Tov is one of these names where the name for holidays in general becomes, you know, a proper name of a person. It's a, it becomes a person's given name. Another example um, that might not be so intuitive and this might be a bit speculative, but is definitely um, a possible a possible example, at least, are the names that are derived from the word Chag. In the Bible, it refers to holidays as a Chag. Chag Hamatzis, Chag HaShavuos, Chag HaSukos. So the word Chag is also used to mean holiday in general. And there are various names in Tanakh that seem to be related to the word Chag. Uh, one example of that would be one of the sons of um one of the one of the sons of God of Jacob's Yaakov Avinu's son God in in the Parshas Vayigash in, in in the book of Genesis one of his sons names was Chagi and one of the one of the wives of King David was the she was the mother of of David's son Adonia her name was Chagit and one of the prophets in the Bible his name was Chagai so Chagi means my holiday Chagai means my holidays in plural. Chagit is some sort of you know feminine, um, feminine, uh, feminine uh, uh, inflection of the word chag. So all of these are examples of the word chag in in proper names in in a person's name. Uh, you know, traditional sources don't necessarily make this point. They don't discuss this. But I do believe that I saw this particular point that mentioned in that article that I mentioned that I uh, showed you earlier from the Journal of Jewish Studies. 
and you know it's a it, it, it's a in in there's something called the elephantine papyri. Um, I will sh I'll show you a little bit about it. The elephantine papyri was a corpus of documents that were found on an Egyptian island called Elephantine and had all kinds of things written in Egyptian, Aramaic, Hebrew, Latin, Coptic, etc. And a lot of these documents were related to the Jewish community or the Jewish garrison of soldiers from the Persian army who were stationed in Egypt. And if you go through those documents, you'll notice that the name Haggai is actually a very popular name over there. So this is talking about, you know, the beginning of the Second Temple period. You have these Aramaic-speaking Jews in Egypt using the name Haggai. So it's not just Haggai, uh, a character in the Bible, in the book of 2012 Prophets, but Haggai is also a name uh, that was used, you know, that we see in the Elephantine papyri, in multiple instances of the name Haggai used. Now the word Chag, whatever, what, what exactly it literally means is very interesting. Some people say that it literally means a sacrifice. Some people say that it literally means a circle. Like, you know, as we know, the Jews dance in circles. So on holidays, you either brought a sacrifice or you dance in a circle. And that's sort of the etymological uh, basis for the name Chag or, 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 or for the word Chag. And then for the, these names that might be derived from the general word Chag. In rabbinic literature, interestingly, the word Chag is the default, the, the unspecified Chag refers to Sukkot, the holiday of Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, is the, you know, Chag, just without saying which Chag we're referring to, is a reference to Sukkot. So that's a, an interesting point, because as we saw before, we know people named Pesach, but we don't know people named Sukkot. So, you know, Chag might be instead of Sukkot. I don't know. It's just it's something to, to think about. In a few days from now, we have the holiday of Rosh Hashanah coming. Uh, we can't hear you anymore. I don't know if your microphone turned off. Can you hear me? Uh oh. Okay, we still can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. When did I get muted? I don't know. Uh, we just we missed a little bit. There must have been something weird with your microphone. Why don't you go back a few sentences? Okay. Um. What did you hear me say? Uh, you talked about Sukkot being the Chag and... Okay, and so I now talk about Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah is the biblical, is the rabbinic term for the for, for the holiday of the beginning of the year. Rosh Hashanah literally means the Rosh is the head or beginning and Hashanah means the year. And even though this term doesn't appear in the Bible, it is uh, it does appear in rabbinic literature. That That's the rabbinic term for the beginning of the year. And I don't know anybody that, you know, any proper names that are based on the word Rosh Hashanah or the term Rosh Hashanah itself, but there is there is an example of the name Rosh in the Bible. One of the sons of Benjamin, of Binyamin, uh, Jacob's youngest son, was actually Rosh. This is in Genesis 46. So it says, you know, Jake, uh, Be Benjamin had 10 sons. Uh, this is 4621. So his sons, Bela, Becher, Ashba, Naman, Achi, and Rosh, Mupim, Bukhupim, Vaart. So one of his sons was named Rosh. So even though the, the name Rosh Hashanah, you know, doesn't seem to have made it into the corpus of Jewish, the word Rosh at least was the name in biblical times. There was a medieval Jewish scholar named, who's colloquially known as the Rosh or the Rush, but that's not actually his name. That's actually sort of an acronym or an abbreviation for Rabbeinu Asher. So his name was wasn't actually Rosh, but it was you know we call him Rosh, but it's not actually Rosh. The biblical term for Rosh Hashanah is Yom Hazikaron, the Day of Remembrance. And in the Bible, there are personal names that are derived from the same root as the word Zikaron, which means to remember. Um, there's the name Zichri. There are multiple people in the Bible named Zichri. There are multiple people in the Bible named Zechariah. So those are names. It's hard to say that it has anything to do with Rosh Hashanah, but it's at least derived from the same root word as the Yom as as Yom Hazikaron in the Hebrew language. Uh, moving on to Sukkot and Pesach, so the name, as we mentioned before, you know, a lot of us know somebody named Pesach. So where does the name Pesach come from? 
it's a, it's a very interesting it's an interesting question. There's a few different theories floating around there. Um, I'll just mention some of the theories. Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky has a book about names called Shemos Ba'aretz. And on page 50, he writes that, you know how the name Pesach started? Because there was somebody who was born on the holiday of Pesach, so they named him Pesach. So that's how the holidays, that's how the name started. So Rabbi Kanievsky is clearly understanding that the given name Pesach is a, is a festal name because it's coming from the name of the holiday. But other theories, other theories don't necessarily agree with that idea. One theory says that the name Pesach comes from a different name in the Bible. Um, this is in the book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 49, has a list of names. It says, B'nai Uza, B'nai Faseach. Okay, Faseach is spelled, the letters are spelled the same way as the word Pesach or the name Pesach, but Faseach is vowelized differently. So it's quite possible, and some theorize this, that the name Faseach is actually the source for the name Pesach that we use nowadays. Um, this, so this name appears in Ezra 2.49. It appears also in Nehemiah 3.6, 7.51, and in Chronicles 1, 4.12. So this might be the original source for the name Pesach. Another idea um, for the possible source for the name Pesach is from a different verse in Ezra, a different name that comes up in Ezra, and that is the name Pesachia. This is, if you look here in Ezra chapter uh, in Ezra chapter ten, verse twenty-three. So there's the name Pesachia. Um, so Pesachia somehow became Pesach. So the, the three different theories. That's the Marsham, Rabbi uh, Rabbi. Rabbi Shalom Mordechai HaKohen, and also in, in in his glosses on the work Tiv Gitin, he proposes this theory that the name Pesach comes from the name Pesach. So we have three theories. One is that it comes from the name of the holiday Pesach. One is that it comes from uh, the name Paseach. And one is that it comes from Pesach. It's interesting that the Bible, the, we call we might call the holiday of Pesach in the Anglo world at least, but technically, if you look at the Bible, it's not called Pesach. It's actually called Pesach, with a segol under the initial pe. Uh, how exactly that came about, that we call it Pesach instead of Pesach, maybe one of the linguists over here will be able to fill us in how that how that happened. It's an interesting question. But uh, So we have these di three different theories of how the name Pesach came about. One interesting point is that at least in my experience, and I'm only here for you know three and a half decades or so, I've never met a Sephardi person named Pesach. It, it doesn't seem to be an, an accepted name in the Sephardi community. So it's quite possible that you know if you if you go with this idea that the name Pesach comes from Psachia, so Psachia is spelled with with a with a saf, right? The word Psachia is spelled the second letter is a saf. So Ashkenazim pronounced Psachia, the way I'm, I'm pronouncing it, Psachia, but Sephardim would pronounce it Petachia or Psachia, with the with the stuff being you know being a T sound or a TH sound. So, in a, in a, from in a Sephardi milieu, it's almost impossible for the name Psachia to be the source of Pesach, but if you go with the Ashkenazi pronunciation, it makes more sense. So now, the fact that it a that the name Pesach, as I know, is only used in the Ashkenazi community, it doesn't disprove that theory. So we, we so we have, we're left with three theories and it's hard to know exactly which one um, comes about. It's also interesting, I had, I had a friend from Holland who was a Baal Tshuva, and in his first life, he went by the name Pascal. Pascal is the, you know, the Latin, I think it's Latin, the Latin the Latin uh, equivalent of Pesach. And then when he became uh, religious, so he started going by Pesach. So, you know, so there is precedent for the name Pesach um, as a festal name, you know, even, even in languages outside of Hebrew, in Pascal, as opposed to let's moving on to Sukkot. So I know, I know as, as we saw before, I don't know anybody named Sukkot. I've never come across the first name Sukkot 
There was a surname Sukos. There's a member of Knesset whose name is Tzvi Sukos. So Sukos is used as a surname, but I haven't come across Sukos being used as a given name, as a first name. Um, I tried as much as I can to try to find out, you know, why, what's the difference? Why Pesach, yeah, and Sukos, no. I tried asking all kinds of scholars and different people, and nobody was able to come up with any coherent answers. But I actually posted the question once on a forum called the Otsa Chachma Forum online. You know, it's, in, it's in Hebrew for Torah scholars. And somebody somebody proposed an answer that, you know, I really, I really should have thought of myself. My second book is called uh, God vs. Gods, Judaism in the Age of Idolatry, which goes through all the stories in the Bible that have to do with the struggle against idolatry. And in the back has an encyclopedia of all the different names of foreign deities that come up in the Bible. It's available on Amazon and Feldheim.com. Uh, one of the names of the idolatrous deities that comes up in the Bible is called Sukkos Benos. Okay, this comes up in the book of Kings, chapter 17, Kings 2, verse 31. It talks about, uh, not 31, it's actually verse um, verse 30. It talks about different idolatry, uh, idolatrous deities that were imported to the land of Samaria after the Assyrians exiled the kingdom, the Jews from the kingdom of Israel and imported people from the east. So it says that the people of Babel made something, the people of Babylon made images of their god, or of a god called Sukkos Benos. So somebody on this Ezra Chachma forums theorized that maybe the reason why we don't use the name Sukkos as a proper name, as a given name, is because it was also the name of a idolatrous deity, so Jews were sort of hesitant to use the same okay the torah uses it as the name of a holiday but for us to use something that's also the name of an idolatrous deity as a proper name was maybe too much for some people so that's why sukos never made it as a proper name i don't know it's an interesting theory i, I don't have proof either way but uh it's you know it, it's something to think about and maybe that would explain why pesach is a name that's used um by people and sukos is not a name Moving on, I don't know any you know any any names that are related to Shavuos per se, the holiday of Shavuos, but there is another holiday that does have names associated with it, and that is the holiday of Hanukkah. So, to, just to give you a little bit of background, we're familiar with um, Ashkenazim versus Sardim, but it's sort of a dichotomy because there's all kinds of other Jewish communities throughout history that are not necessarily Ashkenazi, not necessarily Sephardi. Um, the Romaniote community in the Byzantine Empire was neither Ashkenazi nor Sri. There were other Jewish communities. Um, so if w one example is what I call the pre-Ashkenazic Eastern, Jew Eastern European Jewish community. When we think of Eastern Europe, so we think of you know the Ashkenazim that were there for hundreds of years um, in the latter half of the previous millennium. But the truth is that Ashkenazim really only started coming to um, Eastern Europe, let's say, around the late 1300s and 1400s. And that's when they really started coming there. The Ashkenazi community really started becoming built up. Ashkenaz means Germany. So how did Jews from Germany get to Eastern Europe? They migrated eastwards, right? But before these Ashkenazim migrated to Eastern Europe, there were Jews that were already living in Eastern Europe. Um, that were not that's not per se Ashkenazim. There was a different community of Jews. They're uh, you know I call them the pre-Ashkenazi Eastern European. They're also associated. They're called also the Canaanic community because they were Slavic speaking speaking people. Ashkenazim spoke you know dialects of German that eventually became Yiddish. These people were speaking dialects of Slavic languages, and in fact, in the various glosses that some of these scholars. Um, you know, may have written in, in in Torah sources. They refer to their language as Lushan Canaan, and scholars refer to it as Canaanic, spelled with a K, you know, to differentiate it from from you know the land of Canaan, which was you know the Holy Land before the Jews took over, which is usually spelled typically spelled with a with a C. So this pre Ashkenazic Eastern European community, this Slavic speaking community, um, I actually speak about this whole. 
Canaanic language and this the, this Slavic community in my first book, Lashon Hakodesh: History, Holiness, and Hebrew, which goes through the history of the Hebrew language through a traditional lens, and it also talks about other various Jewish languages. So this Canaanic language is also spoken about in that book. In that community, Hanukkah was actually a given name. So it's not an I haven't seen it come across it in Ashkenazi milieu or in a Sephardic milieu. But in this community, Hanukkah was a legitimate given name, and there, there's there's a lot there was a lot of scholarship written about this community. Um, there's a scholar named Moshe Taub, uh, a professor named Moshe Taub, who writes a lot about them. Not to be confused with my friend Moshe Taub, who writes in Mishpacha magazine, or maybe it's Ami magazine. And there's a scholar Alexander Peter, who also is you know he's one of the biggest names in the in in, in the in the study of Jewish names. Um, he also writes about this community as well. And one of the names that they used to give it was, was Hanukkah. Uh, uh, Professor Peter, actually, uh, uh, Dr. Peter actually wrote to me that there's also evidence of the name Hanukkah elsewhere in, in Eastern Eurasia. Uh, he said that in the, in the com- Jewish community in Georgia, which is you know, next to Russia, but it wasn't necessarily Ashkenazic Jews. It was, it's a sort of separate type of, um, it's not Ashkenazi or Sephardi. It's a it's a different it's a different brand. So one of the surnames that they use is Hanukkah Shvili, and in the mountain Jews who lived in Afghanistan, also not Ashkenazi or Sephardi, or not not regular Ashkenazi or Sephardi at least, um, they had a, they they used a surname Hanukayov. So both both of those names Hanukkah Shvili and Hanukkah Hanukayov literally mean son of Hanukkah, you know. And so that implies that they actually use the name Hanukkah as well as a as a personal name. Because if you're saying that he's the son of Hanukkah, that means that his father, or at least the father of the person who originally took that surname, was named Hanukkah. So they had that personal name Hanukkah. So there you have an example of a personal name that comes from that comes from a uh, what's it called? That comes from the holiday of Hanukkah. Just. Uh, yeah, we spoke about the elephantine papyri. Here's if you want to look up about the Canaanic language, there's a Wikipedia article about it. Um, here's a Wikipedia article about the elephantine papyri. So yeah, th- those are different um uh, more examples of uh of the festival names. Moving on to another example is the name Purim. So the name Purim is actually, you know, we have the holiday of Purim. What about the name Purim? Are there, is there anybody named Purim? So you know, when I first started this, I had never found any sources really, as far as I know, that talk about the name Purim as a as a given name. But anecdotally, I have evidence that the name Purim did exist as a given name, and that is you know when I was when I was younger, I studied in the Mir Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. And if you've ever been to the Mir Yeshiva, if you haven't been there, next time you go to Jerusalem, you must visit. But if you have been there, then you know what I'm talking about. On the stairs to the entrance to the main study hall, there's engraved, literally engraved on the wall, are all these names of all kinds of donors that had given to money to the yeshiva in you know in in the past seventy in this past seventy years or so. And one of the names I noticed once, I saw the name of a person who donated money to the yeshiva. His name was Purim. Purim was his actual first name. I was so tickled by that. I thought that was very interesting. And, and I thought that was very interesting. And we, I, I did something actually very funny. Um, the, the yeshiva actually posted, you know, when it was around the time for the holiday of Purim, they posted the schedule, you know, when are the different prayers or whatever, they posted the schedule on that wall, not so far from where the name of this guy, donor Purim, was, was, was mentioned. And I took down the yeshiva's schedule. I cut a little hole in the schedule where it says the word Purim. So there was like a hole in the piece of paper. And then I retaped it back on that wall in a way that the word Purim from, from the donor Purim was showing through the window on the piece of paper. I was so proud of myself. Uh, I, I, I took a picture of myself. Um, I'll show it to you over here. There's me you know, with that look that the cat, the cat that got the cream look, you know, with this the yeshiva schedule and the name Purim of, from the donor you know, being shown right there. So, so I, th- th- so I, so that was the first time I ever encountered the name Purim. The first time that I was preparing this to give, so I was doing some research, and there's a safer 
called there's a book called Kuntras Hashem Hashadash, written by somebody named Rabbi Dov Ber Takash, who was a scholar, a rabbi from Hungary who s- survived the war and came to Israel, and he was very involved in writing, um, you know, halachic bills of divorce, which are it's very important where you write somebody's name exactly, and he writes lists of how to how to how to spell different names, etc. And on his list, he has the word Purim as a woman's name. So that was interesting to me because um, the name Purim as, uh, that was on the wall in the yeshiva, in the, in the mirror, so this guy Purim, was, who was a donor, his, it was a man. It was Purim Ben something. And this this source, this Rabbi Takash, brings down the name Purim as a female name, which is interesting to me because in general, there's sort of this virtual mechitza that separates male names from female names. You know, there's names in Judaism that are distinctly male, Avram Yisrael Yaakov. There's names in Judaism that are distinctly female, Sarif Garach and the twain shall not meet. Except that there are a few rare exceptions, like Yona, which can go both ways, Simcha, which can go both ways. So I found that interesting that um, that the name Horem seems to be going both ways. When I was preparing this evening's lecture, I wasn't able to find this source again. So I have to really look it up again. And there, some people have said that there are different halachic questions about using unisexual names. Rabbi Chaim Kenevsky in his work, Time of the Crop, um, in the, in the book of Deuteronomy on the on the verse of Lo Yubash Gever Simas Isha, so he has a whole discussion about you know using unisexual names. You know, anecdotally, I had a um, when I was in, when I was in elementary school, there was a kid in my class named Drew, and he had a twin sister named Lindsay. Right, but you know, Drew is a unisexual name. Lindsay is a unisexual. It could have been that the girl's name was Drew and the Ben's name was 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 Lindsay. Could have went either way, but that was just a a funny thing. Then I came across something very interesting. Uh, I came across this more recently. There's a podcast called Sfarim Chatter, um, and Sfarim Chatter podcast had an interview with a professor named Aviva Ben Ur, and Professor Ben Ur. I wonder if she's really the professor Ben Or. <laughs> no uh, relation. Ben, <laughs> no relation. Or means fire and or means light. So they're similar, but not quite close, but no cigar, as they say. So Professor Ben Ur is an expert in the Jews of Suriname. So where is Suriname? If you're not familiar with it, it is a country in South America that a little country in South America. There you can see it. Has a lot of uh, rainforests, and in and um, this professor Ben Ur from the University of Massachusetts talks about the Jews in Suriname. Um, they're basically uh, Spanish and Portuguese Jews, or, or of Spanish and Portuguese or, or origin. So they're basically classical Sephardi Jews that came to South America in the 17 and 1800s not directly from Spain and Portugal, but rather from where Jews from Spain and Portugal stopped off in Hamburg and Amsterdam, London, and they made their way to South America in the 17 and 1800s. And those Jews were actually, many of them were slave owners. And Professor Ben U writes in her book, she mentions this briefly in her podcast episode, but she writes about this more in her book, that from the we have very complete records about the Jews in Suriname. And in those records, we find at least eight instances, eight instances of slaves owned by Jews that were named Purim, and they were all male slaves. So you hear, you come across the name Purim again as a, a, another, as a, as a male Jewish name. Um, in, in her book, in, in, in Professor Ben Or's book, she writes about how the holiday of Purim was particularly important to the Jews of Suriname. And she gives different examples and different ways that that played out. So that was that to me that was a very interesting, um, a, a very interesting thing that you know we, we find some scholarly documentation of the name Purim actually being used. Um, yeah. So I, I I had prepared a lot more than um, than we have time for, but you know, I'll try to get some more points and get some more points in. Another name, this is not quite a festal name because it's not the name of a holiday, but it is the name of a feature of the Jewish calendar. Who's calling me in the middle of a lecture? How, could, how dare they? It looks like it's actually somebody who's invited me to another lecture, but whatever. Okay, so the name Chodesh, the name Chodesh, the word Chodesh means month. 
Um, and or it can mean the name Chodesh means the word Chodesh means month, and the word Chodesh in the Bible can also mean uh, what we colloquially call Rosh Chodesh, the first day of the month. Uh, for example, you know, when it says Lo Chodesh Vle Shabbos, or you know when we say in in, in, in Psalms that we're going to say this on Rosh Hashanah, it says Tiku Bachodesh Shofar. So there it uses the word Chodesh not in the sense of month, but in the sense of the first day of a month. So in the Book of Chronicles there seems to be somebody named Chodesh, okay? This is um, the book of Chronicles, Chronicles 1, chapter 8, verse 9. It's talking about a fellow named Shacharayim, and it says that he begat through his wife, Chodesh, you know, Yovav and Tzvia and Mesha and Malcolm. okay? So it seems to be that his wife's name was Chodesh. Okay, that seems to be, if you take a literal reading of this verse, it seems to be that Shacharayim's wife was named Chodesh. So that would be perhaps an example of a festal name, except that the rabbis um, don't understand it that way. Traditionally, in rabbinic literature, the book of Chronicles is really not taken literally as genealogical lists, or not always taken literally like that, but is a lot of time a sort of fodder for exegetical interpretation. So the rabbis understood this verse talking about Shacharayim marrying a woman named Chodesh as not talking about a man named Shacharayim who married a woman named Chodesh, but as an allusion to the story of the book of Ruth, where Boaz married a woman named Ruth, right? And so they say that, no, her name wasn't really Chodesh, but rather it's an allusion to the fact that they were Machadesh, so Chodesh can also mean Chadash, means new, something new or novel. That the, the, there was a novel halachic decision that was rendered that said that Boaz can marry Ruth even though she was a Moabite because female Moabites are allowed to marry you know, male Jews, but male Moabites are not allowed to marry female Jews. So it was a, a Chodesh in terms of Chidush. It's a new idea, a new expression, just like the moon appears, the new moon every month, so it's also new. So Chodesh is not a reference to her actual personal name, but is a reference to this uh, exegetical idea that there was this new halacha that was promulgated to allow Boaz to marry Ruth. This idea appears in many places in rabbinic literature. It appears in the Targum on that verse in, in Chronicles. It appears in the Jerusalemic Talmud in Yevamos chapter 8. It appears in Medrash Rabbah on Ruth. It appears in the Yalkut Shimonian on Ruth. It appears in the Vilna Gons commentary on Ruth. So they understand it non-literally it's not a name of a person. However, the Malbim, one of the classical commentators on the Bible, Rabbi Meir Leibush Weiser, known by his acronym, the Malbim, he writes that maybe Chodesh was actually her name. Oh, it's such a novel idea, right? That seems to be the literal understanding. But he says maybe it was actually her name. Her name was Chodesh. So she's named after the word for month. So she's named after another um, another feature of the Jewish calendar. And then I looked and looked earlier. I'm like, no, it, the Malbim lived in the late 18, you know, 1800s. It can't be that the Malbim was the first one to propose this idea. So I looked and I looked and I looked, and I found that one of the earlier, early medieval, or one of the medieval um, commentators from Spain, Rabbi Yehuda Ibn Balam or Bilam. Me and my brother-in-law always argue about how to pronounce his his last name. I I say it's Balam because that's what scholars say, but he says maybe it's Ibn Bilam. But Ibn Balam. On that, in his commentary in Chronicles, he actually writes that her name was Chodesh. So there you have it. You know, a, a proper name that comes from the calendar. Um, one more, one, one, one more name that comes from a, 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 you know, a regular feature of the Jewish calendar is derived from the name Shabbos. Professor um, Yonah Sabar was asking about this in the questions beforehand, and I wanted to touch specifically on this point. Um, one second. So the the name Shabbos, the name Shabbos, the name Shabsai, the name Shabsai appears in the Bible three times in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, it seems to have been a very popular, a particularly popular name, at least a long time you know, in, in ancient times. Um, the first instance that this name appears outside of the Bible, I found, is in something called the letter of Aristius, which 
tells the story of the Targum Shivim, the translation of the Torah into Greek, the Septuagint. So, you know, some people consider this letter of Aristias to be a uh, part of the Pseudo Apigrypha, which are books that are not quite part of the Bible, but pseudo biblical in a way. So these these, these books are. Um, it's the, the letter of Aristias, which retells that story, which also appears in various permutations in the rabbinic literature. It retells that story about the Jewish scholars who translated the Bible into Greek and it actually lists the names of the scholars. And two of those scholars were named Shabzai. So that attests to how popular the name Shabzai was, you know, in the Second Temple period. Um, the name Shabzai is also the Hebrew word for the planet, the planet Saturn. So, you know, that's another interesting connection. You know, Saturn is related to Saturday and Shabzai is related to Shabbos. So you know, there's a sort of um, a, a, a polysemous connection in that in that way. And I, I, I found that interesting. Um, so, so Shabzai seems to be related. I, I know I don't have proof. I can't say for sure that the name Shabzai comes from Shabbos, but it definitely, you know, it makes sense to say that. It definitely makes sense to say that. Um, there is a interesting passage in the Babylonian Talmud in Gitten 11a, where the Babylonian Talmud Shimos Muvahakin names which are clearly Gentile names. Give me examples of names that are clearly Gentile names. And the Gemara, the Talmud gives a name Shabsai. Here you see it on the third line. The third, the third line over there, the first word and third line, Shabsai, is given as a name which is considered classically Gentile. It's not a Jewish name. Shabsai is not a Jewish name, seems to be what the Talmud is saying over here. But then the Tosafists over here on the on the, on the the left side of the page, the Tosafists um, say, no, don't say that the Talmud is saying that Shabsai is not a Jewish name. Because Shabsai, Shem Yisrael, who, it's a Jewish name. It's quite a Jewish name. But come on, we find the name Shabsai in many different places. As I mentioned, it's mentioned in the Bible itself, in Ezra Nehemiah. It seemed to have been a very popular name in the Second Temple period. And you know, there were names of Jewish scholars. Shabsai, Shabsai Donolo was an Italian uh, Jewish astrologer, doctor, scientist, who wrote a book called Tachkamoni, which is cited by Rashi in, in, in a few different places in, in Tractate Erevin. So you know, Shabsai was certainly a name that was that was used, um, that was that was legitimately used in the Jewish community. So Tosus is protesting the Talmud's assertion that Shabsai is a is a particularly Gentile name. Tosus is saying, no, 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 it's quite a Jewish name. And so, in order to alleviate that problem, so the Tosafists say, okay, we're going to have to change. We're going to have to change exactly what the text of the Talmud says. You know, it, it change it a little bit, add, add, add a letter, subtract the letter, do something else and say it, it can't be talking about the name Shabsai because Shabsai is quite a new name. Um, nowadays, actually, Shabsai is not, it, 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 I do know a few people named Shabsai, but it's not quite a common name. It's I, it's hard to say that it's a common name. It's it's a it's a fairly, it's a fairly rare name, but it, it is used. Um, there's Shabsai, Shabsai Cohen Rappaport. Um, there's two. When I first gave this lecture, uh, I was referring to the Shach. The Shach, Rabbi Shabsai Cohen Rappaport wrote a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch called Sifte Cohen, known by its acronym Shach. So his name was Shabsai. This was in the 1600s. And then also Rabbi Moshe Feinstein has a grandson-in-law in Bar Ilan University, known, known well, whose name is also Rabbi Shabsai, Rabbi Shabsai Cohen Rappaport. But so so Shabsai is you know it is a no name that is used. But it's uncommon. But it it, it it does it is used. I think personally, and you know, this would be interesting if scholars can quantify this, it'll, it'll do some research and see whether this is actually true or not. But my hunch is that the whole story of Shabzai Tzvi, the false Messiah Shabzai Tzvi, who was very who caused a lot of interesting developments in the Jewish in the Jewish world, his name was Shabzai. So maybe because People didn't want to be associated with Shabsai Tzvi, so they started using the name Shabsai less. So nowadays it's not as common as it once was. Um, it, it, an interesting anecdote, when once we're talking about Shabsai Tzvi and the connection to the weekly holiday of Shabbos, 
So Rabbi Shabbos Atzvi had a had a secretary named Shmuel Primo. Rabbi Shmuel Primo was his secretary. You know, if Nathan of Gaza was his hype man, so Shmuel Primo was Shabbos Atzvi's sort of secretary. And Rabbi Shmuel Primo was asked a question. He said, "Well, is it okay?" It was asked by somebody who's obviously a believer in Shabbos Atzvi. As a believer in Shabbos Atzvi, is it okay for me to beat up somebody on Shabbos if that person doesn't believe in Shabbos Atzvi? And Shmuel Primo wrote back, "Of course, it's uh, of course you're allowed to beat up somebody on Shabbos if he doesn't believe in Shabbos Atzvi, because even though usually you don't, you can't beat people up on Shabbos. You can't, you know, cause a wound to somebody. You know, you can't do it during the week either. But that's a monetary problem. On Shabbos, it's also a ritual issue." And he said, "But if somebody is a is a disbelieves in Shabbos Atzvi, of course you can beat him up on Shabbos because Shabbos Atzvi himself, his very name." embodies the concept of Shabbos. So therefore, you know, everything is okay. I don't even know what that means. But you know, so he was certainly cognizant of the connection between the very name Shabsai and Shabbos. I have been told, Professor Sabar mentioned this in his question, and somebody else told this to me earlier this week, but I have to substantiate, it's been unsubstantiated, that uh, unverified at least to me, I haven't found any sources, that there used to be a custom, I don't know where or when, that they used to name boys who were born on Shabbos, they would name them Shabsai. So maybe that's one of the reasons why Shabsai was to be a particularly popular name, because, you know, like, let's say a seventh of the population would be born on Shabbos, so like a lot of them would have the name Shabsai. Um, just to, so that's one, one, one last point is there's the concept of months. I promised I would talk about months. We're going to have to say it really quickly that there are certain months that we have a custom to use as proper names, like the name Sivan for a girl, the name Nisan for a boy. Rav Chaim Kinevsky in his book Shemas Ba'aretz on page 156 says that names that we are accustomed to already using, like Nisan for a boy, Sivan for a girl, is it's okay to use, but he, he, he he's not happy with taking just a random name of a month, Teves or Cheshvan or you know something like that, and using that as a, as a proper name, he, he wasn't so happy about using that. He did write, though, that if there was a girl named Adar, um, then you know, post facto, he's that's acceptable. He also we also talk about the name Ziv. So Ziv is not one of the months on our calendar because we use the Babylonian names of the months. But in the in the in the in the, in the book of Kings, when it talks about the second month, which we call Er, so it refers to the month of the second month as the name the month of Ziv. So Ziv, which is a, a fairly popular name nowadays, also comes from the name of a month. Some say that the name Nisan didn't start off as like naming somebody after the name of the month. It was a corruption of the name Nisim, like you know, with a mem at the end instead of a nun at the end. There was somebody named Nisim Gaon um, who lived over a thousand years ago. So maybe the name Nisan came from the name Nisim, you know, just like the name Gershom and the name Gershon could be sort of switched sometimes. You know, as or as an editor, I know that people often uh, commit the horrible sin of confusing an M dash with an N dash. So maybe M and N got, got confused, but um, you know, it seems to be that Nissan is probably likely named after the month. So okay, that's months in a brief, and let's uh, let, let let's move to the questions. Well. Thank you very much, Ruven. That was uh, really interesting, and I liked how you really combined. Uh, scholarship with a Torah perspective and brought in a lot of quotes from rabbinic scholarship and and that's that's really exciting. Um, so you can you can leave your camera on because uh, we have some questions for you and pe people who are in attendance. I invite you to put your questions in the Q and A area at the bottom of your screen. Someone is raising their hand, but we won't be able to call on people. But you can write your question in the Q and A. Um, and I'll just start by giving some um, information. Uh, so, in, well, one of the questions in the Q&A is um, that it's talking about what you mentioned at the beginning of using names relating to holidays that are not actually the names of holidays, which is a related phenomenon. So Amalia writes about how Ruth is a popular name for girls that were born on Shavuot and uh, in modern Israel, boys boys that were born on Sukkot are sometimes called Asaf. Um, and so um, I think that's pretty common. And in fact, I found that... As in, Asaf is a biblical name also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's related to the holiday of Sukkot. Right, so, Chag Hasif, yeah. 
Yeah. And um, in my own research on Jewish names of pets, I found that uh, some many people name their pets after something related to a holiday on which that pet was adopted or around which that pet was adopted, uh, like um, a dog adopted around Pesach that is named Afikomen or a uh, goldfish named Mordechai that someone got at a Purim carnival, right? Um, so so that kind of thing, you know, using names that are associated with a holiday, I think is it's a different phenomenon when it's human names. But I think the fact that it exists in pet names is also interesting. Yeah, uh, from my personal experience, the goldfish that you get at the Purim carnival doesn't stay alive till Pesach, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Um, let's see, someone mentions a child named Omer, born on the second day of Pesach. Have you come across that one before? I mean, look, we got to be honest. The name Omer is it, it cl clearly comes from, from Arabic. But you know, if we want to Hebraicize it so we can say that it's related to the, the second day of Pesach, and the, there are sources that call the second day of Pesach Chag HaOmer. Um, Medrash Tadshe refers to it as such. So you know, it's, it's you know, it it, it it makes sense. You know, it, it's it's I haven't seen it. Um, it's obviously it's a, it's a modern Israeli name. It's not something that I've seen in you know, traditional sources. Um, somebody asked, "What does the name Paseach mean?" So the root Pe um means to jump, and also it means to be um, disabled or the 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 paralyzed, lame. I don't know what the technical, what the term they use in English nowadays is somebody who can't move and somebody who can be very mobile, who can jump. So that's what the name Pesach literally, what the what the, what the root literally means. So the name Pesach would be some sort of um, inflection of that. I don't know exactly what it would mean as a child. Maybe it's like a prayer that he should be able to be mobile or maybe it was somebody who was born immobile. I don't know. In, in the context of Passover, so Pesach refers to the fact that God jumped over the houses of the Jews when he brought the plague of the firstborn. So, and then because of that, the sacrifice that's bought, that's brought on the on the day before Passover is called the Pas the Pesach sacrifice. That, and because of that, we call the whole the entire holiday Pesach nowadays. Um, somebody Billy Stein asked a question. You know, if Sukkot is not used because of its idolatrous connection. Then how come Esther and Mordechai are acceptable? They are both names on, on Persian gods. Yes, uh, that's absolutely a good question. Esther comes from the name of Ishtar, which is um, cognate with the English word star, actually, and uh, Astarta and the word the name the the holiday Easter comes from is also related to it. So yeah, that that's a good question. Mordechai comes from the Persian god the, the Babylonian not Persian gods. They're these are actually Babylonian gods. Um, Marduk. Was was one of the chief um, deities of the Babylonian pantheon. So yes, Mordechai and Esther are definitely also seem to have an idolatrous uh, connotation, and that's a question. You know, if if Sukkot no because of this idolatrous connotation, so why Mordechai and Esther? Yeah, I know, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know. It's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Somebody. Um, yeah. So and also some somebody asks about uh, Hebrew uh, the. Perhaps the Hebrew name of Oedipus was Av. <laughs> yeah, how how would you respond to that? <laughs> I think it's just kind of a joke uh, thinking about Oedipus's Hebrew name, um, but that's cute. And um, then I want to just also bring up um, the name Purim. Um, you mentioned it in one of the donors. Purim. Yeah. Near um, so it is actually a common name in Juhuro communities in the Eastern Caucasus, like Azerbaijan and Dagestan. It's a common feminine name. Um, there are several names surrounding the holiday of Purim in the Juhuro community, uh, such as Istir for Esther, Hedeso for Hadassah, Merdeche for Mordechai, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing these. I mean, those are just the same thing as biblical names, just pronounced in their in in their own uh right. in their own fashion right right well hold on i'm almost there uh and then yeah, istir melka which is esther hamalka and the word purim uh which is a, a woman's name in 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 the juhuri uh language so uh, so yeah uh, i think i don't know if that donor was from that background or just uh was an ashkenazi jew who had that name um 
But let's see, other questions. Put your questions in the chat if you have. We have time for maybe one or two more. Um, and if we don't have any more, um, if there's just a sentence or two you wanted to say to wrap it up, that would be great. Okay. Uh, any more questions? No. So I, I, mean, I just wanted to theorize, like, why is it that the months that we do, that, that are, are commonly used for first names, um, like Nissan, Ziv, Adar, the common denominator between all of those names is that they usually tend to fall out in the spring, right? So like maybe you know, because they're like happy, shine, uh, Ziv literally means shiny. Nissan, Nissan is you know, when, the, when the flowers start budding and Adar also means like shiny or like uh, splendor. So like maybe these names are like especially like happy type names. So like maybe that's why people tended to use them as opposed to like you know, a name like Tavis which is like the dead of the winter, it's more dark and gloomy and people aren't necessarily, you know, so inclined to use it. Or a name like Tammuz in the summer. Oh, actually the name Tammuz happens to be also the name of an, a Babylonian deity um, who was the equivalent to the Greek Adonis. So he like he like died in the summer and was re resurrected in the winter or maybe vice versa or something like that. But so maybe that maybe that's why, you know, the, the spring names in particular people would use. Um in our in the, in, the, in the secular calendar, the the these names we have like April, May, and June. So those are all also names of those are actually per, uh, personal names of deities of Greek deities. April is named after Aphrodite, which connects back to what we were saying before about Esther and Ishtar and Aphrodite. These are all sort of cognates um, in um, a, a different pagan cults. Their gods sort of can line up with different names that they represented similar ideas. May comes from the Greek Maya, which was the Greek goddess of mountains. Uh, June comes from the Roman goddess Juno, which was the goddess of like marriage and childbirth. So these are like happy, naturey type things. So like these are like names, like maybe that's why people are using it. I don't know. It's just the idea I'm throwing out there. Thank you. And thank you so much for bringing this interesting topic to our attention and for covering it in such a thorough way. Um, and I'll just end by telling you about some ideas that I have uh, for the Jewish Language Project to expand on this work and to present resources about Jewish names. Uh, currently, we're working on a curriculum for middle school. And if you know of any schools that are interested in starting, in, in using that, in helping us to pilot that, that incorporates information about Jewish names, please reach out to me. And I also am working on, we are working on databases of Jewish personal names and of Jewish surnames around the world so that when people are looking for baby names for their babies, they can use this website and get information about these names. And when people are looking for ge doing genealogical research or just want to research Jewish names around the world, um, they'll be able to get uh, solid information based on the very uh, impressive academic work of Alexander Bader, who is one of the world's experts on Jewish names. So um, if you're interested in getting involved with any of that, we're looking for people to volunteer to get involved and to um, contribute financially to these projects, please get in touch with me. And um, please check our website, jewishlanguages.org and jewishnames.org so that you can see the many resources that we have. And I want to wish everybody well, I a, just saw a, 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 an interesting yeah. question came in from yeah. actually my friend, um, Jacob Shore. He writes, is the feminine name Purim based on the holiday? I had assumed it was about fertility. Right? The word Purim can also be related to maybe the word Priya, which means like is a, is a, is a verb form of making a fruit. So maybe it's you know, being related to fruitful and multiplies. So maybe Purim has nothing to do with the holiday. The, the um, etymology of the holiday name comes from the word Purim, which means uh, a, a raffle in Persian. So he's saying he's saying maybe Purim means uh, fertility. That's an interesting point. Uh, I have to think about that. I don't know. And I see that there's somebody who's raising their hand. Is there a way we can let her ask a question? Uh, or? We can't we can't do that. Um, but thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to me by email. The registration that you got will have my email, and I'll be happy to forward your questions to uh, Ruvain. So thank you, everybody, and Shana Tova.
And thank you, Dr. Bernard, for hosting this.